Next, we'll hear from uh, mywoodlot.com, protecting water quality and promoting sustainable forest management in the New York City watershed. So the New York City watershed is the largest surface storage and supply system in the world. Um, our client, uh, the Watershed Agricultural Council, is a consortium of stakeholders that manage the water for 9 million residents of New York City. Um, they've, uh, they've recently launched a new public outreach website, mywoodlot.com, and have sought creative ways to engage the landowners upstate. Our team uh, is uh, myself, um, Alina Karasova, Annie Mesa, Sophia Ree, and Christy Tugas, and our advisors are Radley Horton and Rachel McCauley. While there's one forest, there's an increasing uh, fragmentation and parcelization of properties. These fracturing processes uh, negatively impact the ecosystem, supports, and, uh, and filters the water. The short-term economic interests of the 30,000 landowners don't always align with the long-term sustainability. A 2002 study by Lupier and Germain showed from 1984 to 2000, the average industrial private forest land parcel decreased in size from over 17 acres down to 14. Um, this trend of subdividing large land parcels into smaller pieces owned by diverse owners with different land use objectives reduces the effectiveness of coordinated management strategies, um, dealing with soil and water conservation, wildlife habitat, timber production, recreation opportunities, and aesthetics. Our team focused on two focal points where we saw opportunities for landowners to reconnect to their land and each other. Uh, the first is the arts, uh, capitalizing on the region's rich history of the Hudson River School of Art, conservation, and the contemporary plein air scene land, uh, to help people see nature more deeply and make deeper connections with other landowners in the land. Uh, the second one was uh, co-op uh, cooperative management um, to help people connect around common conservation planning and preservation. Uh, we believe that mywoodlot.com can act as a bridge to facilitate these deeper connections to the watershed. Uh, and now um, Annie is going to talk a little bit about the arts component that they focused on. Thanks. So our main interest in the arts came from our trip to the Catskills when we met our client and she showed us the watershed and we also met with an ecologist and she shared with us a small anecdote about this particular painting, which is the, back, the background of the slide um, by Sanford Gifford, and it portrays a clear-cut forest and how this painting, like a lot of other Hudson River School paintings in the 19th century, really galvanized the first forest movements in the nation. Um, and we thought it was really interesting how this area, in particular the Catskills, has such a rich history of art and conservation going hand in hand. Um, and so we thought we could draw attention to both this history and then we also realized that it's not just a 19th century phenomena, that currently a lot of people continue to plein air paint and photograph and be inspired by the landscape. So we thought by drawing attention to the history and then what's going on now, we could really both enhance land appreciation and also a large portion of these landowners are, live in the U.S., they, I mean live in the Manhattan. Um, and so they go and only visit their land every once in a while, so we thought we could maybe encourage them to visit their land more often and draw a deeper connection to their land. Um, and so how are we going to do that? We created two deliverables. Um, one of them is a how-to plein air paint. So plein air comes from French, from outdoors, um, painting outdoors, and so we tried to make it affordable and approachable, just ways of getting people to who might at first be uncomfortable with this idea of any age really come and be able to make it approachable by giving affordable advice and also advice from painters and who know how to do it and who know good means. Um, and then our other content piece is a Planar Perspectives blog series. Um, we, paint, we interviewed six current artists in the area and they we asked them about their work, about their process, their inspirations, and really about their relationship to the particular places that they paint. 
Um, and so we created a series featuring each of them for people who maybe don't want to paint but are curious about what's going on, and then for people who do want to and want to hear from experienced voices. Um, this was a quote from one of our first interviews, Elisa Gore. She lives in Inwood Park, um, but she is also a homeowner in the Catskills, and she really views her painting how these places, she's noticing how these places are disappearing that she's depicting and for her how connected she feels with these places and how they really embed in her memory while she's depicting them. Um, and our main takeaways from all of these interviews was basically that there's a big connection between painting or f photographing um, and memory, how when people are in these places and depicting them it really hits them in a way um, that makes them remember the sounds, makes them remember the smells, makes them remember how they felt when they were there. Um, and how in that, in the same vein, it creates a deeper land appreciation in a way that goes beyond words, beyond maps, beyond graphs, in a way that's almost indescribable, how it's a very emotional experience um, and a heightened sensory experience. And also how when they're out there painting or photographing, and people see them and see that they're paying attention to this area, it cre makes people want to pay attention to this area and see, oh, there is value. Someone else sees value in it. Maybe I do too. And maybe I'll whip out my iPhone and also take a photo. Or maybe I'll think about this area in a special way as well. Um, so both seeing them and then also seeing the work that they produce really creates a lot of awareness and conversations about these landscapes. Awesome. And yeah, yeah. So he's going to talk about co-op management. So a lot of what we did was to try and create content for um, our client to put on their website in order to increase viewership on their website, um, and through this, hopefully, encouraging landowners um, to connect to their land. So not only can landowners connect to their land based on an emotional basis with you know the aesthetics of their of their. Um, Woodlot, we also wanted to connect landowners together, that is to say, kind of bridging gaps between neighbors in order to collectively and cooperatively manage their land in order to enhance um, forestry and um, watershed quality, et cetera, et cetera. So this slide is um, really kind of showing the fragmented nature of the land, if we can see the photo on the right, and trying to take that fragmentation and promoting um, watershed health by engaging different landowners. So what we did was we focused on cooperative land management. That's our, those are like kind of plans where um, neighbors, I guess, come together and decide we're gonna kind of pull all our parcels together and um, tackle invasives or like harvest timber together, making it more cost efficient, making um, invasives more easy to tackle, et cetera. Um, so what we produced for mywoodlot.com are like these different um, deliverables saying here are the benefits of cooperative management, how to think of your forest with others, and the first steps towards cooperative management. Um, in brief, they're just kind of introducing the subject to the website and kind of hoping to entice the people who are reading these to think of the subject and approach their neighbors. Okay, so the second way we went about this issue was through interviews, like with the arts component. Um, I interviewed two women. This is Ann Cutter from the Bear Mountain Triangle Forest Plan in New York. And then I also um, interviewed a woman named Julie Rubin from a Three Arrows Cooperative. And they're two very different examples of how neighbors came together um, to look at their land not as the fragmented way that it stands now, but to transcend those artificial property boundaries and look at land as it truly exists in nature. Because that's the only way you can truly combat the problems that are occurring on this large scale. Um, so with my interview um, with Anne, which is up right now, one of the things that I realized is that coming together is relatively straightforward. Neighbors have this thought and they want to do something good for their land. And, you know, they think the, the bigger the better. If I can do this together with the people around me, we can achieve so much more, a greater than a sum of its parts kind of thing. Um, so that was kind of the easy step, coming together. And the same with the Three, Oppo, uh, Three Arrows Cooperative. Actually, you know, this stems back to the 1920s. A group of men bought this 
big swath of land together um, when land was cheap. And it still goes on today that people own the land all together and they implement strategies all together and they just own their house. But there's this greater sense of duty to the people around you because you share that environment. Um, and again, you know, that process was straightforward. But then what we noticed is that there's a gap in, okay, I've created this forest management plan. Now what do I do? How do I actually implement these things? Some foresters and, and service providers like that, they don't get what that means to be a forest management plan. Who are they actually performing a service for? So we found that we can appeal to my woodlot and perhaps let that be the mediating body between having this conglomeration and then actually doing something about it. So as a little bit of a conclusion, um, we believe that our two categories that we focused on are creative ways of engaging with the land. Um, I think that a lot of the projects on the semester were perhaps focused on policy and we're starting to look at the ways, you know, humans are emotional beings. Maybe there's another connection, a deeper level that's going to catch people that aren't caught by policies or aren't, aren't driven by money maybe. You know, there's, there's different people we're trying to appeal to and we're looking at this deeper level of doing so. So with the arts, it's about that heightened sensory experience, really seeing land, not just looking at it. Um, and with co-op management, it's about this isn't just me, this is me and the people around me and we're going to do this together. So those are the two ways we wanted to look at that. I mean, in terms of next steps, if this project continues with future classes, a few of the things we thought about, but were not in our scope, were perhaps creating a calendar for the arts um, events that are already occurring and really bringing those all together into one place so people have this resource where they can go um, and see what's already happening and get involved. Um, we also wanted to look at peer-to-peer -peer networking, which is kind of where we started with this, the idea that people own land and then people want to perform services on land. How do they connect those people? A lot of people own land. They know they want to do something good with it, but they don't know how. Um, so maybe there's like a social network type thing that could be created on the website to connect those people. Um, and finally, it's, there's always that ongoing question of how do you measure engagement um, when outcomes are not quantifiable? Um, and one of the ways we looked at that was a logical framework strategy which it's a it's a chart and it measures inputs and outputs um, when your outputs aren't necessarily something tangible and measurable um, and so we had a little workshop on that and that was great to bring in and that is all we have this is a great quote on the my that website when we see land as a community to which we belong we may begin to use it with love and respect and that really drove us this semester and we really enjoyed the project Great, thank you. All right, let's take some questions. Hi, thanks so much for sharing. I'm, I'm so excited to see what you've been doing all the semester. We're the other side of the group. Um, I was just wondering if you engaged or thought about engaging with youth. Are there children or teenagers or young adults? And because they're usually a source of like active inspiration, and whether or not that's even relevant for that area. I can take it. Um, so my woodlot has, it, I'd encourage you all to check it out. It has a ton of categories of things you, well, you can do with your land. It's entirely voluntary. You know, whatever interests you, whatever drives you, if you know you want to do something cool with the land you own, or if you're a kid, fine there's something there for you. So I think last semester they created a rain garden or like there's arts and crafts, there's photography. You know, it could be anything, you know, super concrete to super creative. And so there is definitely something for children, many things for children. And one of the things that we'd like to do in our report is connect what we've done physically to the other things on that website, you know, because it is, these are deliverables, these are content. There can be links in what we did to things maybe like, if you're a child reading this, what could you do? If you're an adult, a landowner, what could you do? So we definitely want to create like a web for, for all people, because that's really what my woodlot seems to do. They want to reach as many people as they can. I'll just add our, our primary contact, uh, contact Tyler Van Fleet. Um, she lives in New York City, and her whole job is connecting uh, school children downstate with upstate. There's this, 
there's this dynamic, and it's not just the children, it's the adults, but they're approaching it through the children. And she goes to schools every every day and teaches, and they, they, they have uh, kids from the city go up there and vice versa, and they've had uh, mock debates and things, because there, there is this upstate, downstate mentality. There's um, elitism, there's this is our land, why should we care about your water? Um, there's a lot of issues that they're working on, and, and they're definitely, like every day, connecting school children to this project. I think also through that it connects their parents. Sometimes t the children teach their parents. Mm -hmm. So I think that's their hope. Are the little girls we met? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, oh, you want to say when we were? Uh, we met a couple little girls. They were just walking by like the reservoir when we were there and they were like, yeah, we're in the, the watershed club at school. And they're like, <laughs> come join us. Like, tell us what you know. And they knew so much. Like, it was really cute. And I guess they, and it's funny because the people who live there, they don't drink that water. So there's a little bit of a disconnect. You know, they're protecting the water for us. So, you know, there is kind of a gap you have to bridge. But it's, it's nice they have a club. So if they have a club for them, maybe there's clubs for everyone. So <laughs> I think it's great. Hi, great job, guys. I'm Jordana, the TA for the other course. Um, I was wondering if you thought at all about bridging the two sections that you worked on, so the arts and the co-ops, or are there ways to either sell the, um, the paintings or the photographs of the local artists to the co-op? Have you thought about any of that intersectionality? Right. <laughs> no, definitely, that's a great question. Um, we were thinking about perhaps a way of bringing landowners together through what could maybe be agreements between landowners and artists, and if maybe I don't know, some kind of interaction in which landowners c can enable painters to go paint on their land and maybe they'll get paid or maybe they'll get artwork in return, I don't know. Um, but that would be nice, it would definitely be great. And then there are, there's the Wallkill River School in Orange County, which is inspired by the Hudson River School, um, in which this one woman has started a gallery and a workshop, um, and that's a way for people to generate revenue in the area, um, and they do auctions. And then there's some websites that sell art with like a gallery without walls. Um, so there's, there's initiatives going on, but definitely my woodlock could get more involved too. Yeah, thanks, a great presentation, great job. I'm one of those Manhattan uh, Catskill landowners, so I'm particularly interested, and I will definitely go to mywoodlot.com. My question is, uh, do you think there is a optimal size of landowners who can work together effectively? I mean, clearly it's more than two and less than 100, but do you think there is some, uh, for the co-ops, uh, kind of thinking about the, the right size, the right number of landowners? Yeah, and that's interesting because of the two case studies, so to speak, that I did, one was six people and one was 75. So I think it really depends. Um, one of the things that I noticed was that the performance of the co-op is directly related to how dedicated the people in it are. So if, if that has to be small scale, at least to start, then so be it. But because Three Arrows has now been around for maybe 100 years, uh, they've been able to grow and still maintain those principles. So I think it depends. Um, I think what, how many parcels are we looking at right now in that region? 30,000. 30,000. That's maybe too many. So <laughs> I'm not sure the answer, but I think, I think it depends on who's involved and just how established you are. Like maybe for a casual agreement, which is what Ann Cutter's was, six was all you could manage. But Three Arrows, you know, they legally own that land together so they could handle more people. So it depends. 